After a couple of weeks looking at some other things, I want to get back to the study on suffering and deliverance. And I, I guess I could probably retitle the second half of this sermon, A History of Biblical Characters, because that's really what we're doing, is just going through different characters in the Bible, starting in the beginning and going to the end, and looking at their lives in light of their deliverance from God, the various things that they suffered and trials that they faced, and how God came through and delivered them from that. Last time, the last couple of times in this series, we were looking at King David and how he uh, was delivered from Saul 11 different times. Saul tried to kill him at least 11 times, and each time the Lord delivered him. But once he was delivered from Saul, his troubles were not over, because then another trial came, and that was in the form of his son, one of his sons, Absalom. Absalom was David's third son. He was, uh, well, unfortunately he wasn't David's only bad son. David had at least three of them uh, that we read about anyway. In 2 Samuel 3 and verse 3, it gives uh, six of David's sons to six of his wives here, and I'm sure he had many more than that. But it says there in, in 2 Samuel 3 and verse 3, and his second, that is his second wife, uh, or his second son, Kiliab, or Ki Kiliab, of Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite, and the third, Absalom, the son of Maacah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. So David uh, had done what he was not supposed to do, and that was to multiply wives to himself. He had at least eight wives. He really had more. He had these six that are listed off there, which I didn't read them all. Then, of course, he had um, Michael, Saul's daughter, and then he had Bathsheba, which he, of course, shouldn't have had. Um, but then he took more, it says in, in 2 Samuel 5 and verse 13, and he had concubines. So he had, who knows, probably dozens of wives, or at least probably more than 10, anyway. That caused him trouble, because then he's got these kids from different wives, and some of them aren't getting along so well, uh, as we will read about here in a little bit. But anyway, back to Absalom. Absalom was quite the guy. If you turn to 2 Samuel 14 and verse 25, he was a gifted individual. He was a very handsome man. He was praised by many in Israel. Uh, 2 Samuel 14 and verse 25, it says, But in all Israel there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. From the sole of his foot even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. So that's a pretty special guy. I don't think most of us can say that, that we have no blemish in us from the sole of our foot to the crown of our head. And um, so he was an impressive guy. He had charisma, as we will see later. He had good looks. He was very persuasive. Um, generally a dangerous individual. You take somebody that's really good looking, that has a lot of charisma, and is very persuasive, and typically somebody like that is going to be a very dangerous man because they're going to be able to get pretty much anything they want. And that's what uh, happens here with Absalom. Sometimes God's blessings to us can actually be a curse to us. Somebody that's exceptionally beautiful, that often can be a curse. For women, men are only interested in them for that reason. And you know, for uh, men, it could be the same thing. So be thankful that you're average, like most of us are. It's better that way. Absalom also uh, was a bit of a rebel, and we'll see that, but something that tips us off to that is the fact that this guy would let his hair grow out for an entire year without cutting it. And then he would cut it once a year because it got so heavy on him that he couldn't take it anymore. Uh, there in verse 26, just the next verse. And when, this is Second uh, Samuel fourteen twenty six, And when he pulled his head, for it was at every year's end that he pulled it, because the hair was heavy on him, not because he wanted to give it to locks of love. Therefore he pulled it. He weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels after the king's weight. Now I did the math a while back and wrote a little note here in the margin of my Bible. That's about three and a third pounds of hair. That's a lot of hair. I don't know how much 
know, ladies with longer hair, I don't know how much your hair weighs, but you know, three and a third pounds, that's, that's a ton of hair. So he, he must have grown hair at a, at a pretty good rate. And uh, it wasn't because he cared for the law of God that he cut it off. It was just too heavy for him. So every year he'd just pull it, which means to basically buzz it, just cut it real short. Now, it's interesting that this proclivity of his to be rebellious and have this long hair ended up probably causing his death. And we'll get to that at the end of the study. Uh, it doesn't specifically state that, but I have a feeling that it was the long hair which caused his death. And you'll see what I'm talking about when we get there. But like I said, this, is, this shows that he had an ungodly and a rebellious nature. If you turn to 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 14, see here what the Bible says about men having long hair. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 14, it says, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? This is something even nature should teach you. We should just know that. There should just be something within us that God's put in us. When you see a man with long hair, you just say, man, that's just not right. That's shameful. Nature should teach us that. It, it, you know, it, at different times throughout history, nature certainly has not taught a lot of people that. In the 1960s and 70s, you know, long hair was a fad. Uh, I myself had long hair, believe it or not. Back when I was an early teenager, I had hair the whole way down to my shoulders. Um, I know you're laughing, just trying to think of what that must have looked like. And it was probably worse than you can imagine. So, <laughs> Because not only was it long down to my shoulders, it was shaved. The whole, all the sides of it were shaved. So you couldn't tell when it was down, but if I pull it up in a ponytail, the sides were all shaved and the, hair, the head was long. Or the top was long. Yeah, it was, it was terrible. I mean, we laugh about it, but it was an abomination. What, what, I don't know what parents are thinking. Like a lot of parents, the, the crap they allow their kids to do is just amazing to me. I don't know what was going on in my parents' head. But my grandma, for at least to her credit, she didn't like that. And she thought, you know, that boys and men shouldn't have long hair. Well, you know what my dad's argument was? Well, number one, my grandfather that was a preacher had long hair, so therefore it must be okay. But number two, and more importantly, Jesus had long hair. And if Jesus had long hair, it must be okay for Chad to have long hair. Uh, so the first argument's not an argument at all. That's just dumb. Preachers do all kinds of dumb stuff. So if they have long hair, that doesn't matter. The second argument is just flat out not true. Jesus did not have long hair. You say, how do you know that? Because the Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. You think Jesus did something shameful? Of course not. You got all these dumb pictures of Jesus with long hair. They're just pictures. They're Michelangelo's idea or some Catholic painter's idea of what Jesus looked like, and they're lies. Jesus did not have long hair. Some people say, well, he was a Nazarite, and Nazarites were to let their hair grow. Jesus was not a Nazarite either. That's another lie. He was from Nazareth. Okay, Being from Nazareth has nothing to do with being a Nazarite, even though the words sound similar. It has nothing to do with it. He was not a Nazarite. Therefore, he didn't have long hair. You know how I know he wasn't a Nazarite? Nazarites were not to drink wine. Jesus, it was say, he said of himself that his enemies said that he was a wine bibber, which meaning, which means that he drank wine. Now they were accusing him of drinking too much. Obviously he didn't, but he did drink wine. Secondly, a Nazarite was to not come in contact with a dead body while he was under the vow of a Nazarite, while he was letting his hair grow. Jesus touched lots of dead bodies and healed them, brought them back to life. So clearly Jesus did not have long hair. But Absalom did. And Absalom by this was showing that he was not a godly man, that he was a rebel at heart. And this was the you know, this wasn't just some New Testament precept or something. Just the fact that the Nazarite was to let his hair grow while he was under the vow of a Nazarite, and then to cut it off afterwards shows you that that is not the norm. The norm is not for men to let their hair grow long. And so all these biblical pictures that you see of men in the Bible, and a lot of them have long hair, I don't believe that for a second. The priests were told they were supposed to pull their heads, which was, means to cut it short. So no, men did not have long hair back then. But Absalom did. Probably one of the reasons why Absalom had long hair 
is the reason why Absalom was also uh, tried to take the kingdom from David and why David's other kids were all screwed up is because David did not discipline his children well. If you turn to 1 Kings 1 and verses 5 through 6, we see here that this was the problem. I haven't really got into what Absalom did yet, but I will. And this will explain to us one of the reasons, probably one of the fundamental reasons, why Absalom rebelled against David and tried to kill him. Because David did not discipline Absalom the way he should have. This also explains why Adonijah raped his own sister. Adonijah, not Ad, uh, Amnon. Amnon raped his own sister. Amnon was another son of David. David didn't train and restrain his children. And it also explains, as the verse will tell us here in a second, why Adonijah, David's other son, Absalom's brother, tried to take the kingdom from David right at the very end of David's life. So it can come back to bite you if you don't train up your children the way you should now. Years later, it could come back and you'll be sorry. So you want to nip that stuff in the bud now. 1 Kings 1 and verse 5. It says, Then Adonijah her son, uh, the son, I'm sorry, then Adonijah the son of Haggith exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. Now this guy's an idiot. He just watched his brother, as we'll get into in this study, he just watched his brother try to do the same thing and get killed for it. And then he says, I'm going to do the same thing. Just because dad's 70 and he's laying in bed and he can't really get up and do anything anymore, I'm going to be king. You know, as if God can't stop you from being king, even if the king can't. Verse 6. And his, here's the problem, and his father had not displeased him at any time in saying, Why hast thou done so? And he also was a very goodly man, and his mother bare him after Absalom. He was another looker, good-looking guy. Haggith must have been a beautiful woman, probably, had some good genes. It says, His father had not displeased him at any time, saying, Why hast thou done so? At no point in this kid's life, when he did something reprehensible and disobedient, did David ever say, why'd you do that? David just let him go. Whatever Adonijah wanted to do, and I assume that was a way with all the kids, whatever they wanted to do, David was a permissive parent. You know, this permissive parenting crap is not new. It's been around for a long time. David was just going to let the kids grow up in the way that they thought they should go. He was just going to let them you know, explore their own personalities and, and just try to and just figure out who they were and, and just develop into the, into the good and godly people that they will be eventually if you just let them, let their, their natural good inclinations come out. You know, the kind of nonsense you hear today. Well, that didn't turn out so well for David, did it? Samuel was the... Well, before him, Eli was the same way. Eli restrained, did not restrain his children. And the Lord told Eli that his sons were going to die because of that. And Eli died also, actually, when he found out that the ark had been taken. But he was told there in, in 1 Samuel, I'm not going to turn there, but 1 Samuel 3.13, that his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not. Samuel was the same thing. The people said to Samuel that thy sons follow not in thy ways. Therefore, make us a king. So it's pretty sad when you see a king, a prophet, and a priest, all three, and those three men, did not restrain their sons, their children, and it turned out very badly. Now David loved Absalom. He loved him way too much. He loved him even after he killed his own brother, David's own son, Amnon. Look at 2 Samuel 13. 28 through 29. You know, loving your children is great. Everybody should. That's the natural thing to do. But when, you're so, but when your children are wretched sinners and they do something worthy of death and you just love them so much that you can't possibly make, make sure that justice is done, you love them too much. And that's what happened with David. David should have had his son Amnon put to death for raping his sister. That was a capital crime in Israel. And David didn't. 
And then Absalom took it into his own hands, and Absalom killed his brother, David's son. 2 Samuel 13, 28 through 29. And Absalom command, had commanded, I'm sorry, now Absalom had commanded his servants, saying, Mark ye now when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say unto you, smite Amnon, then kill him. Fear not, have not I commanded you. Be courageous and be valiant. And the servants of Absalom did unto Ammon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose, and every man gat him up upon his mule and fled. I've made reference to what happened prior to this. You'll remember that Amnon just had this crush on his sister, which is kind of gross. But uh, in those days, that was... Um, People married pretty closely in those days. But anyway, he had a crush on his sister and he wanted her so bad he couldn't think of anything else. And he came up with this, his friend came up with this plan that his sister would come in and, and he would, Amnon would feign himself to be sick and his sister would come in and bake him some, some food and, and then he would force her and that's what he did. And she even said, you know, the, the king wouldn't withhold me from you. He, he would have probably given him his sister to marry. Like we think that's kind of strange, but... In those days, they would have done that. But uh, anyway, he forced her, and that, and Absalom was incensed about that, and rightly so. And David was, said David, it was said of David that he was wroth about it. But that's as far as it went. Oh, he's just really mad. Well, you should have been, like, stoning him. He should have been killed for that. And if you'd have killed him for that, Absalom wouldn't have killed him, and then, you know, it wouldn't have cascaded from that. Uh, 2 Samuel 13, 37 through 39. You see that David still, even after Absalom murdered his brother, David still has this affinity for Absalom. He still loves Absalom so much that he just can't let it go. But Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of uh, Amahud, king of Geshur. And David mourned for his son every day. So Absalom fled and went to Geshur and there and was there three years. And the soul of King David longed to go forth unto Absalom, for he was comforted concerning Amnon, seeing he was dead. So I don't know, apparently he didn't think much of Amnon. Uh, I wouldn't blame him for, you raped my daughter, I wouldn't think much of you either. But uh, he, he just, he's just longing to see Absalom again after he murdered his brother. Verse 14, chapter 14 and verse 1. Now, Joab, the son of Zeruiah, perceived that the king's heart was toward Absalom. And David had so much inordinate affection towards Absalom that even after Absalom tried to take the kingdom from him, tried to have him killed, he still, and when, when Absalom was killed for it, he still wept for Absalom. Oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son Absalom. Let me show it to you. 2 Samuel 18 and verse 33. This is absolutely ridiculous. And I totally agree with Joab. Joab chastised and rebuked David and said, What are you doing? This guy tried to kill you and all of us, and you're weeping for this murderous son of yours. You'd have been happier if we'd all died and he'd have lived. That's what Joab said to him. This was, I mean, David was a good man. Don't get me wrong, but David was... Totally out in left field with this thing. It just shows you how blood can run thicker than water. Second Samuel 18 and verse 33. When the king was much moved, this is after Absalom was killed. And the king was much, much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, thus he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Maybe I'm just hard-hearted because I don't have kids and I don't know what it feels like. But I'm telling you, there's something wrong with that. Your son tries to murder you. He murdered your son, tried to take the kingdom, and then you're going to weep and cry, Oh, I wish I had died in your place. Give me a break. Come on. That's ridiculous. I can see if he would have felt bad, and maybe he did. He felt bad that he didn't train him well. He didn't restrain him well, and it was partially his fault for the way Absalom turned out. I can see that, but that's not really what he's, what he's weeping and mourning over. He just wants Absalom back so bad. 
Absalom was a rebel. He stole the hearts of the men of Israel with his slick tongue. Look at 2 Samuel 15, 1 through 6. Second Samuel 15, 1 through 6. And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one is of one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed or deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, Moreover, O oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. See, he's buttering these people up and just saying, Oh, if, if, if I were only the judge, if the king would just make me the judge, then all these, all of you people that are having all these troubles and you've got these suits and you've got the, all these complaints and you've been wronged and I would right every wrong. I would give you justice. I would hear you out. I would make sure that you got what is coming to you. If just the king would put me in charge and I feel bad for you guys because the king is just not taking care of you. He's just not there for you. People are dumb enough to believe this kind of stuff. Good looking guy with charisma, who's persuasive. And a lot of people are just stupid enough to believe it, can't see through somebody like that. Verse 5, And it was so that when any man came to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. Oh, no, don't, don't, don't bow down to me. Takes forth his hand. He, he pulls the guy up there and kisses him. Oh, don't, don't, don't bow. I'm just a man just like you are, you know. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to, came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. He's a seditionist. He was an evil man. He was able to deceive the men of Israel into making him their king. Verse 7. And it came to pass after 40 years that Absalom said unto the king, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vow that I have vowed unto the Lord in Hebron. For thy servant vowed a vow while I abode at Geshur in Syria, saying, If the Lord shall bring me again indeed to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. As I've, I've showed you, taught you many times in the scripture, don't believe everybody that sounds religious. Right? Saul sounded religious, didn't he? Right? You got these people at the end of time will say, Lord, Lord, have not we prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And Jesus will say, I never knew you. There's lots of people. Balaam, the false prophet. Balaam talked a good game, didn't he? Lots of people talk a good game. The, the Simon that got baptized, the, the sorcerer, he talked a good game. But he showed his true colors. So don't believe everybody that talks about how they're a Christian or how they love the Lord and praise the Lord and all this stuff. Yeah, Absalom was a wicked man. And here he is telling some story about how he promised to serve God if God brought him out of this place. Verse 9, And the king said unto him, Go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron. But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as ye hear the sound of the trumpet, then ye shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. And with Absalom went two hundred men out of, Jer out of Jerusalem that were called. And they went in their simplicity, and they knew not anything. Here's another warning to you. Follow not a multitude to do evil. We read that in Exodus 20, 25 and verse 2, 23-2, I think it is. Follow not a multitude to do evil. You know that in Acts chapter 19, when Paul went and preached in Ephesus and he was turning men from idols and Demetrius the silversmith that made his living making these shrines for Diana, the, god, the false goddess Diana, he realized that he was going to lose his income and he raised up this great multitude 
and got, got the whole place in an uproar, and they cried, Great is Diana of the Ephesians, for two hours. They didn't know what they were doing. They were just following the crowd. You want to be really careful about following a crowd. Because here are 200 guys in their simplicity, and they didn't know anything. They were just following some charismatic leader because some other people were following him and didn't have anything to do that day. You want to be careful about that. Be careful about joining protests. I was going to say in riots, but don't ever join a riot. <laughs> but be careful about joining protests. I'm not saying not to do, not to go to protest. I've gone to protest myself. But just be careful, be wary, know who has organized the protest and what the point of it is. For goodness sakes, don't go to Washington, D.C. and protest the, the vote of the election of Joe Biden and then storm the Capitol building because you're an idiot and you're following a bunch of provocateurs that were let in there. And then end up rotting, rotting in prison for months. Be really careful about that. Don't let your emotions take over. If you do go to a protest and people start doing stuff that's crazy, back away. Get out of there. Don't let your emotions take over. You got to think. Use your brain. Verse 12. And Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gilonite, David's counselor, from, the, from his city, even from Gilo, while he offered sacrifices. And the conspiracy was strong, for the people increased continually with Absalom. Some people say, oh, I don't believe in conspiracies. Well, you don't believe in your Bible then, because the Bible says the conspiracy was strong, and the Bible talks about conspiracies numerous times, calls them conspiracies, straight up. So Absalom ends up being made king. And when David hears about this, he flees. Verses 13 and 14. And there came a messenger to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. And David said unto his servants that were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee. For we shall not escape from Absalom. Make haste to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring evil upon us and smite the city with the edge of the sword. As we've seen, I think, in this series and in other places, there's a time to flee. There's nothing wrong with fleeing when there's, you know, when that's, when there's a time for that. Jesus Christ fled when it wasn't his time. Paul fled. He was let down over the wall in a basket. Well, David fled this time too. He fled the face of Saul different times. Nothing wrong with fleeing when that's the right thing to do. Now David had a counselor named Ahithophel and Ahithophel was among the conspirators. And this is really sad. This would be probably more painful than most things that people face when you have a trusted counselor, a trusted friend, and he turns on you. And that's what happened here with Ahithophel. And David prayed that the Lord would turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Verse 31, and, and the Lord answered that prayer too, as we'll see. First, uh, second, second Samuel fifteen thirty-one, And one told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O Lord, I pray thee, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Now, some people might think, well, that's impossible. Ahithophel is such a wise counselor. He's done so well for so many years. There's no way that he's just going to come up with some bad counsel. That's impossible. No, it's not impossible. The Lord can do anything. And the Lord did that very thing. It's really interesting how he did it. So David's worshiping God and his friend Hushai the Archite comes along. And he tells, or David tells Hushai to go to Absalom and feign himself to be Absalom's servant so that he can defeat the council of Ahithophel. Because Hushai wanted to stay with David, and David says, no, you're going to be a burden to me. Don't stay with me. Go and pretend you're with Absalom, because most of the nation's with Absalom. He's probably not going to suspect much because everybody else is with him. Go pretend to be with him, and then you can defeat the good council of Ahithophel by being like a fifth column in there. 
uh, verses 32 through 34. And it came to pass that when David was come to the top of the mount where he worshipped God, behold, Hushai the archite came to meet him with his coat rent and earth upon his head. Let me just pause there for a second. David's son has usurped the kingdom from him. He is on the run for his life. And what does he do? He worships God. David worships God when he is in deep trouble. Now, in this, David was a good man because I will tell you, and I have seen this, and maybe some of you have seen this too. I have seen when people get in deep trouble or they're in deep grief, they don't go to the place that they should. Instead of going to church, they don't want to go to church. I've seen this happen before. It's really sad. I've seen this where people's spouses die and then they don't want to come to church. The very place that they need to be the most, they don't want to be. But David wasn't like that. David worshipped God when he was running for his life. He had enough time to go to church even when he's running for his life. Verse 33, unto whom David said, if thou passest on with me, then thou shalt be a burden unto me. But if thou return to the city and say unto Absalom, I will be thy servant, O king, as I have been thy father's servant hitherto, so will I now be, so will I now also be thy servant, then mayest thou for me defeat the counsel of Ahithophel. David says, you're going to be more valuable to me as a mole as a fifth column there, then you are being on my side. This is what you call an act of godly deception. And God blessed it. God blessed a lot of David's acts of godly deception. Now, Ahithophel's counsel was was as if a man inquired at the oracle of God. Look at uh, 2 Samuel 16 and verse 23. It's going to be really hard to uh, defeat this man's counsel because when this man speaks, people think it's almost as if the voice of God is booming down from Mount Sinai. This is like one of the prophets saying, thus saith the Lord. I mean, this guy, when he speaks, it's like God himself is speaking. How are you going to overturn that counsel? Well, we'll see how the Lord did it. 2 Samuel 16 and verse 23. And it says, And the counsel of Ahithophel, which he counseled in those days, was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God. So was the counsel of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom. He's got a reputation. Definitely somebody you want to have on your side. So Ahithophel counsels Absalom some good counsel. Well, I say good counsel. Good counsel in a worldly sense, in a Machiavellian sense. This was good counsel. It was reprehensible, evil counsel, what he told him to do. But it worked. And this is what the wicked do. They do what works. They don't care about what's right. They do what works. Go read the book by Machiavelli sometime called The Prince. I don't know if you've ever heard of it or not. It's just a little small book. It was written, oh, I don't know, back in the... 15, 1600s, I think. I can't remember. A long time ago, he was writing it to a friend of his who was going to be the king, as I remember anyway. And he was basically telling him, here's how you do it. Here's how you rule. And it's all very worldly wise information. You wouldn't want to implement it if you're a godly person. But if you are a wicked person and you want to rule and you want to make sure that people are doing what you say, you follow that book, you'll go to hell, but it'll go, for, it'll go well for you for a while until the Lord destroys you. I've heard, I think I've, somebody told me that was one of Bill Clinton's favorite books. I don't doubt it a bit. I've, I've, I think I've heard somewhere that pretty much every U.S. president has that book on their shelves. But I, you know, I don't remember where I even heard that, so don't take it from me, but that's what my pea brain is remembering anyway. But Ahithophel's counsel was pretty much like the counsel of Machiavelli. Uh, Verses 20 through 22. Then said Absalom to Ahithophel, Give counsel among you what we shall do. 
So Absalom's being wise. He's seeking counsel. And Ahithophel said unto Absalom, Go in unto thy, go in unto thy father's concubines. Concubines are kind of like wives that aren't exactly get all the privileges of wives, but they have kids for you. Which he hath left to keep the house. And all Israel shall hear that thou art abhorred of thy father. Then shall the hands of all that are with thee be strong. So they spread Absalom a tent upon the, ho- the top of the house, and Absalom went in unto his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. Like I said, this is wicked counsel, but it was effective. Because David has been driven out of his own palace, and now they put a tent up on the roof of it so the whole, all Israel can see it, and everybody watches Absalom going into the tent and into his father's concubines in the place of his father. And they're all think that Absalom now is strong. Absalom has now usurped David's kingdom. So Ahithophel gives him that counsel. Turned out to work pretty well for, for a time anyway. But then Ahithophel gives him additional counsel. And this additional counsel probably would have resulted in David's death. This was good counsel. Versus, um, where is it? Uh, 17, 1 through 4. Verses 17, chapter 17, 1 through 4. Moreover, Ahithophel said unto Absalom, Let me now choose out 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue after David this night. And I will come unto him while he is weary and weak-handed and will make him afraid, and all the people that are with him shall flee, and I will smite the king only. And I will bring back all the people unto thee. The men... The man whom thou seekest is as if all returned. So all the people shall be in peace. And the saying pleased Absalom well and all the elders of Israel. That sounds good to me. I mean, hit him while he's weak. He's on the run. He's weak. He's tired. Just go in there and do a blitzkrieg and hit him real hard. And his men are going to get scared. They're going to run and I'll kill him. It's just going to be a precision strike. I'm going to kill the king. And then everybody's going to follow you, Absalom. Oh, sounds pretty good to me. But Absalom here is being wise, I guess you could say. Uh, this was the Lord's doing. And Absalom decides to get a second opinion, which is a good idea. You know, it's always a good idea to get a second opinion and the multitude of counselors, their safety. So Absalom decides that he's going to um, go ask Hushai. See what Hushai has to say about this. Little does he know that Hushai is there to confound the whole thing. Verses 5 through 13. Then Absalom, or then said Absalom, Call now Hushai the archite also, and let us hear likewise what he saith. Now apparently Ahithophel wasn't around when this happened. I don't. The way that I read this, I think Ahithophel must have moved along, and then Ahithophel found out later that his counsel wasn't... wasn't uh, Followed, because I'm assuming Hithophel would have had some arguments here with Hushai if, if he was standing there. So he wants to hear what Hushai has to say. Verse 6, And when Hushai was come to Absalom, Absalom spake unto him, saying, Ahithophel hath spoken after this manner. Shall we do after his saying? If not, speak thou. Talk about a plan coming together. You know, David wanted Hushai to go in there, defeat the council of Ahithophel, He goes there and buddies up with Absalom. And then Absalom, after he gets this outstanding counsel from Ahithophel, for some reason, he says, you know what? I just want to get a second opinion. You think this is a good idea? Hushai, and if not, tell me why. And now Hushai has got his opportunity. Verse 7, And Hushai said unto Absalom, The counsel that Ahithophel hath given is not good at this time. For, said Hushai, Thou knowest thy father and his men, that they be mighty men, and they be chafed in their minds as a bear robbed of her whelps in the field, and thy father is a man of war and will not lodge with the people. Oh, he's mad. I mean, you've gone against him. He's chafed. He's ticked. He's like a bear robbed of her whelps, and and they're going to fight like you know what. This is not a good idea. He's not going to lodge with those men in the field. Verse 9, Behold, he is hid now in some pit or in some other place, and it will come to pass 
when some of them be overthrown at the first, that whosoever heareth it will say, this is a slaughter among the people that follow Absalom. See, if you go in there and you try to kill him, they're going to be so fierce and they're going to kill some of the men of Absalom and then the other men of Absalom are going to hear about how the, you know, the men of Absalom are dying here and this is not going to be well. This is not going to turn out well at all. And he also that is valiant, whose heart is as the heart of a lion, shall utterly melt. See, they're going to be afraid of David's men. Hushai is telling them. And all Israel knoweth that thy father is a mighty man, and they which be with him are valiant, are valiant men. Right? He killed Goliath. Right? He, Saul killed his thousands. David is ten thousands. You don't want to do this. This is a bad idea. Because, boy, as soon as they fight back and they kill some of the men of Absalom, the men of Absalom are going to become weak-hearted, and they're going to run. This is just a bad idea. Don't listen to Ahithophel. Of course, this is all BS. It's all nonsense. But it sounds good, right? Therefore, I counsel that all Israel be generally gathered unto thee from Dan even to Beersheba as the sand that is by the sea for multitude and that thou go to battle in thine own person. Yeah, Absalom, you need to get out there and lead the fight. You know, Hithophel wanted to go out there and take care of it for you. No, no, you need to go lead the fight because you need to be right out there in front leading these men. That was a great idea, huh? Good idea of Hushai. So shall we come upon him in some place where he shall be found, and we will light upon him as the dew falleth on the ground. And of him and of all the men that are with him, there shall not be left so much as one. It's going to be total annihilation. We're just going to wipe them all out. You, be, you lead the charge, Absalom. You get out there right in front. Moreover, if he be gotten into the city, then shall all Israel bring ropes to that city, and we will draw it into the river until there be not one small stone found there. If he gets to the city, don't worry about it. We'll just tear that whole city down. We'll just wipe that thing clean. We'll take him out. None of this precision strike. We're talking total war here. Don't listen to Ahithophel. We're going to totally wipe him out. Absalom thinks that sounds pretty good. So Absalom accepts the counsel of Hushai over the good counsel of Ahithophel, but here's why. Because the Lord had appointed him to do so because he wanted to destroy Ahithophel. This is really interesting. Verse 14. And Absalom and all the men of Israel said, The counsel of Hushai the archite is better than the counsel of Ahithophel. Why did they say that? Because it wasn't better but the Lord deceived them into thinking it was better. The Lord put that in their minds. The Lord can turn the counsel of the wise into foolishness. And he can make people believe stupid things. Here's the rest of the verse. For the Lord had appointed to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel to the intent that the Lord might bring evil upon Absalom. I love that. So yeah, can the Lord do that? You bet. Could the Lord give our president or the, pe the powers that be, the people that are in charge, could he give them bad counsel through somebody else and make them accept the bad counsel instead of the good counsel from some wicked person? Of course he could. But those are some of the lessons that we get to at the end here, so I don't want to get ahead of myself. So then Hushai does what every good spy does, and he goes, runs back and tells David, you know, what's going on here. Verses uh, 15 and 16. He wants to give David the heads up so David can get out of there. Then said Hushai unto Zadok and to Abiathar the priests, Thus and thus did Ahithophel counsel Absalom and the elders of Israel, and thus and thus have I counseled. Now therefore send quickly and tell David, saying, Lodge not this night in the plains of the wilderness, but speedily pass over, lest the king be swallowed up and all the people that are with him. So Hushai has accomplished two very important things here. First of all, he has made the men, and I mean through the Lord's help, made the men reject the good counsel of Ahithophel and take his bad counsel. But then secondly, he's a spy and he gets information back to David to let David know what's going to happen. So David can get out of there. So David got the message and escaped. Verse 22. Then David arose and all the people that were with him and they passed over Jordan by the morning light. There lacked not one of them. 
that was gone over, that was not gone over Jordan. So every one of them, they get out of there. Absalom's thinking he's got this great plan, he's going to go attack them, and they're gone. He's not able to do it. Now Ahithophel, the, the humble and meek man that he was, when he finds out that his counsel was not followed, he kills himself. So the Lord took care of that problem too. No more bad counsel from Ahithophel. Verse 23. 2 Samuel 17, 23. And when Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his ass and arose and got him home to his house, to his city, and put his household in order and hanged himself and died and was buried in the sepulcher of his father. That is a proud man right there. When you have a reputation that when you speak, it's as if the oracle of God is speaking, that kind of goes to your head. I imagine that Hithophel had installed some like 48-inch doors in his house because otherwise his head would be banging against it when he walked through. Well, when his counsel was not followed, he was so offended and so hurt by that, he just couldn't deal with it. How could they not listen to me? I gave them good advice. This idiot gave them bad advice. He just couldn't take it. And he goes home gets his house in order, and hangs himself. The Lord can take care of wicked people like that. I, I've said this before, but I do ad admire uh, the man's um, organization. I appreciate that. You know, somebody that's going to kill themselves, the least you can do is get your stuff in order and let everybody know where everything is. So Absalom went to battle against David on his mule and he got his head stuck in an oak tree and he ends up hanging there until Joab kills him. This was some of that good counsel that Hushai gave him. You know, you get out there, you lead the charge. 2 Samuel 18 and verse 9. I'm just skipping here. I'm not going through this entire account, this entire chapter. I'm just hitting the high points. And Absalom met the servants of David, and Absalom rode upon the mule, and the mule went under the thick bowels. Bow is it bowels or bows? I think it's bows. Is it bows? Anyway, the thick bows of the oak tree, or of the great oak, of a great oak. And his head caught hold of the oak, and he was taken up between the heaven and the earth, and the mule that was under him went away. This is why I say I think his long hair was the death of him. Chances are his hair got caught in the branches of that oak. I mean, I suppose it's possible that it you know, pinned his neck in, a, in the Y of the oak tree or something. But it wouldn't surprise me as he's galloping on that mule and his hair is flying up in the air and he goes under those limbs and that, his hair gets caught up in those limbs and the mule just keeps going. And there Absalom is hanging there by his hair or at least by his head and there's nothing he can do. How embarrassing, huh? Not as not as not is not as is yeah, not as embarrassing as what happens next. Verses fourteen through seventeen. Then said Joab, "I may not tarry thus with thee." And he took three darts in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom until he was uh, while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. And ten young man, men that bear Joab's armor compassed about and smote Absalom and slew him. And Joab blew the trumpet, and the people returned from pursuing after Israel. And Joab went back to the, uh, held back the people. So, kind of a cheap shot. Not exactly following the rules of just war when some poor guy is there hanging by his head and you throw three darts through him. But you know what? He had it coming to him. So uh, you reap what you sow. You want to do something like that? Well, expect to get darts through your heart. And then the men, they cut him down and finished the job. And then they threw him in a big pit. I don't know if I have that here or not. Maybe I didn't, uh, I didn't read far enough. Verse 17, And they took Absalom and cast him into a great pit in the wood and laid a very great heap of stones upon him and all Israel fled every one to his tent. So they took care of him right there. 
There was no calling the coroner, no getting a death certificate, no embalming, no funeral, no nothing. Just threw him into a pit and covered him up with a big pile of stones. It was an ignominious death, which he deserved. So David was again delivered from death by God. 2 Samuel 22, 2-4. through four. These are the words of David. This is also part of uh, Psalm 18. You go read Psalm 18, and this, these words are pretty much verbatim there for part of it. 2 Samuel 22 and verse 2, And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my rock. In him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower, and my refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me from violence. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. This was just one of the enemies that David was saved from by the Lord. Now, there are some lessons that we can learn from this, a number of them. Lesson number one, God will allow, sometimes, will allow close family members to afflict us. Doesn't get closer than your son, does it? God allowed David's own son to cause him much trouble, and it can happen with us too. Matthew uh, 10 and verse 21 Matthew 10 and verse 21. Jesus here is foretelling his disciples of some of the persecution that they are going to face. Matthew 10, 21. He says, And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. That's exactly what Absalom was trying to do. Rising up against his father to try to have him put to death. You know, sometimes the people that are closest to us can cause us the most pain. As a matter of fact, it's always the people that are closest to us that cause us the most pain. Joe Blow walking down the sidewalk doesn't cause me any pain. He can walk down the sidewalk and call me every name under the sun and do, you know, and and disparage me all he wants. And I'm just going to be like, that guy's crazy. You know, just laugh it off. I wouldn't care. If my dad did that, I'd feel pretty bad. If my brother did that, I'd feel really bad, wouldn't I, right? It's only people that are close to you that can cause you pain. And the closer somebody is to you, the more pain they'll cause by doing the same thing that somebody else that wasn't as close to you uh, would have caused. Matthew ten thirty four through 36. You know, that's why I've got my that uh, page on the website where I, uh, whenever I find a really nice comment towards me, I put it on there. Uh, when I say really nice, I mean really nasty, really mean one. And, I mean, that just gets me excited. Every time, I mean, I just look for the worst comments I can find. Every time I get a really, really bad one, I put it on there, and that makes me happy. But if it was my own family saying that about me, it'd be a totally different story. Right? I wouldn't be uh, putting it up there for the, the world to see. Matthew ten thirty four through 36. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth, Jesus said. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. When people are converted and then afterwards they suffer persecution for it, who do they almost always suffer persecution from? Family. And close friends sometimes. But it's usually family. It's funny. The people that are the closest ones to you cause you the most pain. Especially if the family happens to be quote-unquote Christian. Then expect them to cause you a lot more trouble. If you have family members that are atheists, they ain't going to care what your religion is. But you got family members that are Christian so-called, oh yeah, they're going to cause you all kinds of grief. All right, lesson number two. If you don't discipline your children, they will be a source of suffering in your life. Proverbs 10 and verse 1. I've got a whole string of verses here. I'll just rattle them off. Proverbs 10 and verse 1. This is why it's important to train up children in the way they should go and discipline them. Because otherwise they're going to be a thorn in your side for the rest of your life. Proverbs 10 and verse 1. 
And the Proverbs of Solomon, a wise son, maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. For mothers that have had a foolish son, you know what that's talking about. Now, that's not necessarily saying that, that this foolish son here wasn't trained up correctly. Because, you know, God himself was a father and he trained up his sons obviously very well. And guess what? His sons go. His sons sometimes turn, rebel against him. You got in Deuteronomy where um, there was a provision made there for parents that had, and these are for parents that had disciplined their son. If you had chastened him and you had brought him up the way he was supposed to be brought up and he rebelled, you brought him to the judges and you said, this our son is a drunkard and a glutton. He's a rebel. And he would be stoned. And that was when they had chastened him. So it's possible. I mean, it happens. Not just possible. It happens. that You train them up the way they should go and sometimes they don't continue in it and they do rebel. And when they do, it's a heaviness. Proverbs 17 and verse 21 He that begetteth a fool doeth it to his sorrow, and the father of a fool hath no joy. If your son grows up and just does foolish, stupid, wicked things, you're not going to have much joy of him. Proverbs 17 and verse 25. A foolish son is a grief to his father, and bitterness to her that bear him. 1913, a foolish son is, a calam is the calamity of his father and the contentions of a wife are a continual dropping. And then Proverbs 29 and verse 15. See, David experienced this. As a matter of fact, I just thought of this. Solomon may very well have been thinking about his own brothers when he wrote these Proverbs. His brothers were Adonijah, Amnon, Absalom, he very well might have had great subject material in his own house that he grew up in, watching his brothers be a grief to his father and bitterness to her that bear him. I just thought of that. Never thought about that before. Proverbs 29 and verse 15, uh, 29, 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. And that's what happened in David's case. Remember, it said that he had not displeased him at any time. He left him to himself. And if you leave your children to themselves, they will bring you to shame. And you know what? This is true physically too. Leave them by themselves in their bedrooms by themselves. If you're dumb enough to give them a computer or a smartphone, leave them in their bedrooms by themselves. They will bring you to shame. I know what they will be looking up in their bedrooms by themselves with a smartphone because I was a stupid, evil teenager one time too and I know what I looked up. Leave the child to himself with a smartphone. He will bring you to shame. Guaranteed. Lesson number three. Showing favor and sympathy to rebellious children will only make them worse and will come back to bite you. You can't negotiate with terrorists. If you try to be show favor and sympathy to rebellious children, it is not going to turn out well. Let favor be shown to the wicked, the scripture says, and he will not learn righteousness. You can't do that. Those children want to be rebellious. You chasten them. Well, they're young, and hopefully that will take care of it. But when they get older and they get to the point where your job is done and there's nothing you can do, when they get to those late teenage years or those, you know, 18, 19, where they're out of the house or could be, don't show sympathy and favor to rebellious children. You know what? You want to act like that, you go. And I will be here when you want to come back. You want to come back? You want to repent? You want to act right? I'll be here with open arms, just like the prodigal son's father was. But you want to act like that? You want to be rebellious? You go. You are not welcome here. Lesson number four. 
Lesson number four. Your friends will sometimes turn on you, but God will never forsake you. Remember Ahithophel? Dear, trusted friend and counselor David. He turned on him. He did a Benedict Arnold on him. But God didn't forsake him. And this is what the Apostle Paul's experience was too in 2 Timothy 4, 16 through 17. 2 Timothy 4, 16 through 17. Paul says that my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. All of Paul's friends forsook him. No man stood with him. He was there all by himself. He's standing before Nero. I don't know if this is before Nero. His first answer I don't think was before Nero. I think, or was it? I can't remember. One time he stood before Nero, one time he stood before another one. Anyway, this was the first time he stood before the, the Roman emperor and no man was there with him. Everybody forsook him. He's there all by himself. But the Lord didn't forsake him. The Lord was with him. And he was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. He was not martyred this time. He was released. And history has it that he went Well, he talked about going to Spain. Now, we're not told in the scripture that he did, but he planned on going to Spain. And history has it that he went out to Spain. He went the whole way to the British Isles. And then he was apprehended again, and eventually he was put to death. But his first answer, he was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. His friends weren't necessary. It's great. Friends are very helpful. But you know what? Even if your friends forsake you, the Lord can take you up. Lesson number five. God can make our wicked, oppressive leaders listen to foolish advice that will thwart their plans and destroy them. See, God can send strong delusion to people to make them believe something crazy. Second Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12, uh, 11 through 12. You say, well, that's hard for me to believe that God could send strong delusion to make people believe some crazy lie. Have you been around for the last year and a half? Look at all the people that believe this insanity that we have been living through. And there are actually people out there that believe all this stuff. Like, oh, it's just, you know, like, millions of people are just dropping like flies and all this stuff. We gotta wear masks and, you know, slow the spread. You know, 15 months to slow the spread. You know, remember that? Supposed to be 15 days. Turned out to be 15 months, right? Or more. Second Thessalonians two eleven through twelve. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. They don't love the truth, and therefore God says, "Oh, you don't love the truth? You don't want to submit to my truth? Well, fine. I will give you all the lies you want. I'll give you even more lies than you want. I will turn you over to a delusion, so you will believe things that are insane." You will believe that a child can choose for himself whether he's a boy or a girl. I will make you believe things that are insane. You will believe that there are 50 some genders out there and that you can be whatever you want. God will make you believe a lie, will make you a total idiot if you reject the truth. And that's what's happened to this country and this and the whole Western world. God can take lesson number six. God can take the wise in their own craftiness and defeat the worldly counsel of the wicked. Job five and verse thirteen. You see, they've got all their plans, all their machinations. And sometimes it seems like, well, they're almost unstoppable. It's, you know, how, how are we ever going to stop it? What are we ever going to do? But you know what? The Lord can turn all that around. He can turn those plans into foolishness. He can, he can make them fall into the pit that they dug. 
He can. He can make the very stone that they're trying to push. They're trying to get this stone pushed right up over the crest of the hill so it'll roll down over all of us peons. And guess what? He can make them stumble and fall and the stone will roll back over them. To use an analogy. He can make these fools take their own medicine and die from it. Right? I mean, that'd be pretty easy. 2 Thessalonians 2 No, Job, pardon me. Job 5 and verse 13. He taketh the wise in their own craftiness, but the, and the counsel of the froward is carried headlong. Take them in their own craftiness. Joe Biden and Gates may think they're getting that um, saline injection that they're supposed to be getting, and they may actually give them the wrong one. They may actually give them the COVID vaccine. He can drop over dead in two or three days, like you know, tens of thousands of others have. You never know. The Lord can defeat the worldly wisdom of the wicked. First Thessalonians, First Corinthians, one nineteen through twenty. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? He can take them in their own craftiness. They could come up with this thing that they now have where they're going to, well, they haven't mandated it yet, but now it's been approved where they can inject your kids with this poison. 11, 5 through 11 year olds. And before long, I'm sure they'll mandate it in the schools. And guess what could happen? People could start pulling their kids out of school in mass, bankrupt all these public schools, and crash the whole system. You could take the wise in their own craftiness. Wouldn't that be awesome? Isaiah 19 and verse 11. Isaiah 19 and verse 11. Surely the princes of Zoan are fools. Zoan was in Egypt. The princes of Egypt are fools. I mean, Egypt was a mighty empire in these days. Surely the princes of Zoan are fools. The counsel of the wise counselors of Pharaoh is become brutish. How say ye unto Pharaoh, I am the son of the wise, the son of ancient kings. Wisdom, the, the Egyptians were known for their wisdom. Even to, to this day, we marvel at the wisdom of the Egyptians, how they built the pyramids and, and some of the things they did. It was just absolutely amazing. They, they still can't even figure out how they did some of the things that they did. And yet the Lord says, these princes of the Egyptians are fools. He can turn the counsel of the wisdom of the wise into foolishness. Lesson number seven. Our enemies will reap what they sow and will be judged according to their works. You saw what happened to Absalom. Absalom wanted to kill his father. He wanted to take over the kingdom. What happened to Absalom? He ends up dying. He reaped what he sowed. Galatians 6, 7 through 8. You know, Bill Gates wants to mass murder millions and billions of people, wants to reduce the world population. He said that, his own words. He wants to reduce the human population. Well, he could be killed by his own medicine. Or the Lord could take him out with some disease or whatever. He could, he could suffer the very thing that he's trying to put on everybody else. Galatians 6, 7 through 8. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall <clears throat> of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Absalom planned a conspiracy and reaped what he sowed and died. David, remember what he did? He went and worshipped God. And the Lord... 